Join us now for Let's Just Talk with Katherine Raker. This is Katherine Raker of Let's Just Talk. Tonight we have a wonderful guest. Her name is Teresa Rice, and she is a next stage patient advocate. And we want to welcome you to our show tonight. Welcome. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Thank you so much. Now, you're from Chicago, aren't I you? I am. Yes. That's a great place to live. <laughs> um, you know, you look so young, right? <laughs> Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, how long you've been with Next Stage, and your story. Okay. Okay. Um, like she said, my name is Sharissa Rice. Um, I'm 40 years old, so I'll take that compliment about being so young. <laughs> um, I've actually been with Next Stage now for about five years. I joined them in 2012. So, yes, about, about five years. Um, my kidney disease comes from lupus, and so I was diagnosed in 1997. Um, I was a junior in college, and that's when I found out that I had the disease. Um, about maybe uh, six months or so is when I also found out that I had some kidney um, function that was failing as well. Well, you know, were you shocked when you found out? You, first of all, you had lupus first. Yes. And were you shocked? What happened when you got lupus? What were the signs of all of these different things that you've gone through? Because you've gone through a lot. Yes. yes. Go ahead. So um, in 97, um, I was a junior in uh, college. And I kind of describe myself as a nerd, um, you can say. Really? And so <laughs> I was always going to class, always on time. And during this time... It was like right before spring break, um, before we let out of school, and I hadn't been going to class. And finally, my roommate noticed that I hadn't been going to class, and she's like, what's up with you? And I was just so tired and worn out, and I suspected that I had a cold, but hadn't been to class in like three days. And finally, when I got out of bed, I looked at myself, and I had broken out in like a rash and still didn't know what it was. I was kind of scared, even scared to tell my parents what was going on. But finally, after that week, I called my mom and said, something's wrong with me. I don't feel good. I'm breaking out in a rash. It's like everywhere. Did you um, get purple, you said? Yeah, and I kind of got purple. I had like this purple rash in my eyebrows. It was kind of like on my face. And um, as the days progressed, it started getting everywhere. It was on my hands, my Did feet. It, itch? it had kind of like an itch, but when you scratched, it hurt. Mm. So it was like really painful. And then once that kicked in, then I started getting joint pains and my body ached. And I was just really, really tired. And I... I slept so much that I didn't even notice the rash until, like, my friends pointed it out. And then my hair started falling out. It wow. was just like a snowball effect of everything just started hitting me. And so it was like fatigue, the rash, the loss of hair. I just basically did you, didn't care When did you anymore. go to the doctor's? Um, finally, like, like I said, I built up the courage to call my parents. I'm like, it was like right before spring break. So I was going home anyway. And so I told my mom, I'm like, something's going on. I'm, I'm really scared. I don't know what it is. I've got this rash everywhere. My hair is falling out. I'm hurt. I'm aching. And so we went to the doctor and my initial diagnosis was an allergic reaction from makeup. And mm -hmm. back then I really wasn't a makeup person. And I'm like, this can't be makeup. This is really I, I don't know I was just scared so and um it was just fear built up and so I'm like this can't be makeup and finally the doctor they started running tests they started sending me to specialists because um of the joint pain that I had as well so um they suspected fibromyalgia they came up with some other diagnosis like sarcoidosis and then finally they ran some blood work and 
maybe after all the running to different right. types of specialists and um, seeing all types of doctors, I finally got the diagnosis of lupus. So it took about a four-month period before I got four that diagnosis. Four months? Yeah, wow. four-month period. So had you lost a lot of weight? What, it, what was going on? Oh, yeah. And a, so I lost a lot of weight because it was a loss of appetite. And so... I'd say I was kind of a chunky girl, so I'd say I was about 160 when I first started. But during that four-month period, I got down to like 120, so I had lost Whoa, a lot that's of a weight. a lot of weight. Yeah, and I was like pretty malnutritioned, and it, it was scary to look in the mirror, actually, to me, because that was one of the, the initial shocks. Not what was going on with me, but the, the visual thing that was happening with me. Right. Um, it's just like it was a different person. My skin had kind of like darkened. And like I said, the, the rash started out purple. But as it um, progressed, it scaled over kind of. So it not only physically changed me, it mentally changed me as well. Now, did it cause you to be depressed? I can say I had a bout with depression. I will say that. Um, and a lot of things with self-esteem as well. Um Especially with a purple rash, right? Yeah, and the loss of hair. I mean, right. it was really traumatic. Um, did you have to get a wig? I did wear wigs back and forth. Um, wigs were my friend. Um, not in the summertime, though, because they got a little hot. So I tended to be a little free and just snatch the wigs off back then. But That's right. um, when I was out in public, yeah, I did wear a lot of wigs and scarves. Yeah, so. yeah and it had to, especially when you're that age... Mm -hmm. really affect your confidence level oh yeah um that's why i said like it was it weighed on me like more physically like i was basically transforming things were happening physically but more of the mental right part that really hit me i felt like why me why did this happen at a prime time where uh, you know i was just a year away from graduating from college and it felt like it was so the end minute, of the you were world. 18 when you were going to graduate from college but i was actually 19 19. 19 so you're you're one of these brain kids <laughs> you are the you're talking about the nerd you know, yeah, right? yeah yeah right yeah. was yeah. It, so you would excel so you were you were a junior when you were 18 um i was 19 19, 19. When you were a junior yeah i was 19 S about to turn 20 so yeah 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 so but you really enjoyed it i did i i like school um yeah my husband calls me a professional student so <laughs> I like school. If it wasn't for the loans, I'd probably be in school now. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's some people that just love school and they love to teach and they love to be with people. And you look like you're a people person. I like learning new things, meeting new people. Yeah, so, yeah right. It's fine. Right. So, um, so finally you get lupus. Mm -hmm. You get diagnosed. Then what? Then I thought that having lupus was like the traumatic part. I think the treatment part. And then on top of learn going through a kind of like chemotherapy to suppress the lupus then i found out that i had some kidney damage and that i was diagnosed with kidney disease and that they were telling me that i would have impending kidney failure and to get listed on the kidney transplant list but because of i call it being young and dumb and kind of naive i wanted to like suppress that part and not face that fact so um, I've been dealing with kidney disease ever since I can say about 97, but I'll say I didn't accept it until 2006. Hmm. Well, that's, that's normal <laughs> probably, right? I guess. I mean, when you, you know, when they told you the treatment for lupus, was that tough? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, because... Even when I lost my hair with lupus, um, it was also like a chemotherapy. So something that was supposed to make me feel better a lot of times made me feel worse. And a lot of times the side effects of some of those um, drugs, some, you almost feel like, why am I taking this drug? You know, You're making if it's me supposed, sick? Right, it almost did they made make me you, sicker. Did, did, they, did they give you nausea and all that other kind of stuff? Sometimes they gave me nausea. Um, a lot of times you felt almost like you had the flu. Um, it was like you had good and bad days, but when right. you took the treatments, it was like, oh, what's the purpose of this? What What is it actually doing? Because actually I felt worse than, you know, sometimes you go through, I feel worse than the actual the diagnosis that it's supposed to be curing or suppressing. Right. So you found out that you, because of the lupus, you had kidney disease, right? Mm -hmm. 
And we're going to talk about that in the next uh, segment. Okay. But then also I heard that you might have had heart problems as well. As well, yes. As well. So that was even more difficult to accept. Exactly. You were falling apart, girl. Uh, no, right. <laughs> you thought, right? I thought. Uh, did you get closer to God during that period of time? Yes, it did. At one point, um, I questioned, um, I guess, my relationship with God. But as time progressed and my mom kind of gave me a pep talk through the months and the years, I realized that um, something that she always said was that your misery ends up being your ministry. And so um, that has helped me to um, deal with what, ha what I've been through and right. to help others as well. Right. And you know, I told you before the show that my brother he had kidney disease mm -hmm. and was on dialysis and my aunt was and it was hard for me for it was hard for him to realize that he had kidney disease. Okay. okay. So you want to give the website out? The website is nextstage.com. That's nxstage.com. And we'll be right back on Catherine Raker's Let's Just Talk. We are back on Let's Just Talk with Teresa Rice, the patient advocate for next stage uh, hemodialysis, right? Yes. Now, you found out you had kidney disease, and so you had lupus, and the lupus caused the kidney disease. Yes. So did you go into renal failure? Not immediately. Um, the lupus caused the kidney failure. And because the lupus attacked my kidneys, it caused protein in blood to be in my urine, uh, which eventually led to the kidney failure. Because everything is so interconnected, um, right. like um, the kidneys do this big job. And I didn't know until they failed the actual work that they did. Um, mm -hmm. They impacted my heart. Because the kidneys weren't flushing out the fluids toxins. and the toxins, um, it caused my heart to work a little harder. And so, therefore, put me into heart failure. Um, so, wow. I've been living with congestive heart failure for about uh, 12 years now as well. And you checked your family. None of these people had any of this no, stuff, right? Um, no, they have, um, you know, high blood pressure and some certain diseases but um as far as like heart failure and lupus nope i'm the you're it. the lucky winner yes. you're the lucky one right yes there's always got to be one right <laughs> yes so and that's so me. uh does your sister have any problems no my sister um she healthy. older or younger than she's you? younger actually we're 11 years apart so wow all of my parents surprise so. oh okay mm -hmm. all right so how did you deal with the kidney disease part of it. What happened to trigger it that you found out where you're, do you start having burning? What, what happened? Well, when they first saw me, um, like I said, a couple of months after my lupus diagnosis, I right. got the um, pending kidney um, failure. And so my first reaction was to ignore it. Um, they told me to take medications for Which you it didn't? to kind of suppress it. And no, I didn't take my medication mm, like I was supposed no. to. I did not. Um, you were a good girl on that I one. was not. I You're was good. not. And I thank God for looking at me. I had some, I know I probably kept my guardian angel pretty busy because. Um, they were watching you. Yes, because like I said, my way of dealing with it was not to deal with it. And so. So did you have an episode with the kidney failure? No, and that was my issue. Like, they told me they saw blood and protein in my urine. For me, I was still urinating, so in my mind, I didn't think I had a problem, even though I was seeing a nephrologist, even though I was, you know, constantly going for blood work and testing and giving them urine samples. Still, in my mind, I'm urinating, so I'm okay. And it wasn't until my kidneys actually went out when I had to start dialysis in 2006 is when I was like, I got a problem. And that's why I said I'm pretty, I was pretty hard headed that it actually took for my kidneys to go out for me to go. So okay, one maybe day I should do something. you couldn't go. I could go, but there was a point where I was fluid overloaded and the doctor's like, we can't do this anymore. You need to start dialysis. So what did they tell you dialysis was like? 
Initially, they told me about peritoneal dialysis. I have by this time I was married. Um, I had four kids, and you had so, four kids by this time. Uh, yes, in wow. two thousand six. Wow, my youngest at that time was three. Wonderful. So you didn't have a problem getting pregnant or I anything? Did not, no. Wow. Probably wasn't supposed to, but like I said, at that time I was pretty hard headed and I did what I wanted to do. Right. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> you finally had to go for dialysis, yes. and what was that like? Um, it wasn't as traumatic as I thought it was going to be, and it still wasn't what I expected either. Um, they recommended peritoneal dialysis, which is the dialysis that uses your peritoneum in your stomach to filter out your blood and um, the toxins. And so what I, I got a catheter placed in my stomach, and maybe three months later, I was using the catheter. And it allows you to do dialysis at home. And with peritoneal, you do exchanges based on um, basically your function that you still have or if you don't have function. So usually people range maybe up to one to four exchanges a day. I was doing four exchanges a day, but I was still able to work and maintain my family. So you didn't have to go into a center? I did not, no. So so you did it four times a day? I did four times a day. So exchanges is when they put the fluid in your stomach, and like I said, it pulls the toxins in the fluid, and then you let it out. And so depending on, like I said, your kidney function um, is how many times a day you have to do the exchanges, as they call them. Right. And so I was doing four exchanges. And like I said, I was working. So I do an exchange before I left for work. I do a exchange at work. And then I do one at home and then one right before bed. Okay. Now, when did the heart problem get to a point where it really caused you a problem? So, um... I guess the lupus probably um, had an effect on my heart as well. But like I said, the back and forth of gaining weight, a lot of times loop, um, kidney patients put on fluid, um, retain a lot of fluid. And so mm -hmm. that made my heart work a lot harder. And so I was given a cardiologist, let's say, probably... A couple of months right after I started dialysis, mm -hmm, so I started mm -hmm. seeing a cardiologist as well. And so they were saying, we're monitoring you right now. So the severity of my heart issues didn't really get impacted until 2009. And what that's happened when in, I 2009? in 2009? So we fast forward to 2009, but in 2006, I want to rewind just a little bit. In 2006, I was doing um, peritoneal dialysis and... Like I said, I was ignoring the fact that I had kidney issues for a while. Mm -hmm. But in 2006, when I started peritoneal dialysis, I started listening to the doctors more, doing what they recommended. And so I guess by the grace of God, I, um, my kidney function came back. I was no longer on dialysis. Wow. So like I said, I started taking my medication more regularly. I was taking it when I was supposed to, doing what they wanted me to do. I was exercising, you know, eating right. And so I kept functioning for three years. And I What kinda, happened, you know, it, so it was wonderful. For three years, mm -hmm. you didn't have to do any dialysis. No. You didn't have to do any of that. I did not. And did you think by that time it's over with? I, I guess wishful thinking. I kind of thought, you know, maybe I won't have to be on dialysis anymore. I felt good. Um, you know, things felt like they were normal again until I was on vacation in 2009. And actually, we were in Vegas and um, we were walking around and I got really, really tired really fast. And I couldn't take two steps without needing to stop and breathe. And for the rest of the vacation, um, my family basically wheelchaired me around the vacation until it was like even in the wheelchair I couldn't breathe. And so I had to um, cut the trip short and go home and go to the ER immediately. And once I got to the ER, um, I had to be basically put to sleep and they intubated me, which is how they help you to breathe. And um, that's when I woke up and I found out I was back on dialysis. Um, I woke up with a chest cap for dialysis. I woke up with a pacemaker, and they told me not only did I need a kidney transplant, but I needed a heart transplant as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, so at that time, it was just like... How old were you then? Um, 2009. So I was about 32. 32. Yeah. 
Wow. That's pretty young mm -hmm. to be in the shape that you were. Yeah. And I was in a pretty bad shape. And pretty with the bad. kids, how did the, let me ask you about your family. Mm -hmm. How supportive were the kids and your husband with all of this? Because they were dealing with it too. Oh yeah. And I tell people, no matter what form of dialysis that you choose, your family is affected by it. And um, my kids were pretty young at the time, but um, I think they are more appreciative of life, I will say that. I mm -hmm. think it it was kind of traumatic how things happened that second time around because I just went, they thought mommy was just going to the hospital and she would be out, you know, in a couple of days. But this time around, I was there for um, a couple of weeks and the adjustment of my husband trying to be that, forefront person was when things changed. Come to the hospital, take care of the kids, mm -hmm. make sure they got to school and mm -hmm. work. Oh, yeah. I can imagine he wanted to go on vacation after those two oh, weeks, oh right? Oh, my gosh. I'm sure. Just thankful that we have some very supportive parents, too, that were there to step into that gap where right. when I was really sick. Right. So. And on that note, we need to take a short break, okay. and we'll be right back with Catherine Rakers. Let's just talk. Go to nextstage.com. That's nxstage.com. We're back on Catherine Rakers. Let's just talk. Uh, and you know the wonderful thing about this program next stage his is probably the reason why you are with us today mm -hmm. uh, and you know after your kidney failure basically your lupus then your kidney failure then you find out that you got to have a pacemaker mm -hmm. hmm well what did that feel like waking up to um i was angry really angry um even though the pacemaker i the doctor always called it like an insurance policy um i was angered at the fact i felt like it was just so many surgeries and doctor visits that it just seemed like it was becoming overwhelming and um then i felt like why do i need a pacemaker i'm not that and i felt like at that time only old people had pacemakers <laughs> so you know it was like why do i have to have a pacemaker and they're like your heart, if we could really describe it for you, is basically hanging on a string and it's not beating, but it's really just like shaking. And I'm like, what? And they're like, because of the fluid that um, your body hasn't taken and they described it as how a little kid blows up a balloon and keeps blowing up that balloon and how it loses its shape. And that's kind of how they describe my heart. So that was kind of traumatizing too, just to hear those things. And it was kind of scary. And for me to hear that, um, like I said in the beginning, how when they told me about the pending kidney failure, I ignored it. That's kind of how I faced the, the um, heart the music, failure as the well. The music. And, and I kind of like wanted to kick myself because I'm a psych major. And so oh, it's really? like, yeah, it's <laughs> like, you know better and you know how to deal with things. And so losing the kidneys and basically thinking that you're going to lose your heart as well, I guess mm -hmm. it's like going through the stages of grief. And so one of the stages is denial. So, right. you know, I, I was just like, no, nah, no, in my mind, I didn't tell anybody around me, but in my mind it was like, I'm not doing this. No, I'm not going to do it. Were you always that strong-willed? Pretty much. I'm a Taurus, so. <laughs> You're a Taurus. <laughs> I'm oh, okay. stubborn well, that, expl well. <laughs> that explains it. That explains I'm it. I'm a little stubborn. Right. So, um. Well, one of the <laughs> things that amazes me is that you're a mom. Mm -hmm. You are a wife, a mother. You were working, and then you were dealing with all these wonderful diseases, right? Mm -hmm. When did you find out that you didn't have to have a transplant for your heart? Well, um, once in 2009, once I went back um, on dialysis, um, back then, I guess everything was happening so fast. So 
the option of home dialysis wasn't really discussed. So Mm -hmm. I went in center and I was in center for about eight months. And I'll say those eight months were probably hell for me and my family. Um, I was going in center Monday, Wednesday, Friday at four o'clock in the morning. um, Four o'clock in the morning? Yeah, that was the earliest shift. So I was thinking I can do treatment. And once I got off the machine, I can go to work. And it didn't quite work out how I planned. Um, (laughs) It went, I started, um, I was doing the treatments and I went to work for about two months. And finally, I just couldn't do it anymore. It was just wearing me out. Um, And I'm the type of person that when I wake up, everybody wakes up. So the family was getting up with Mm. me. My husband was getting up with me. At four o'clock in the morning. At four o'clock. And I know they hated it. And so... We did this for eight months, and I'm sure once I started home, they were so happy. But during that eight months, um, like I said, I was doing the exact opposite again of what the doctors had told me. Not again. Again. And so. Crazy girl. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So usually in center, they tell you, you have to watch your fluid intake. And so. Because you're only there three days. You're only there three days. So they're trying to remove As much as they can. They can. And trying to do the work of a healthy kidney that works 24 hours, seven days a week. So they're trying to do that work. And most of the time, it's three days a week and about three to three and a half hours is like three and a half, four hours is usually the normal treatment for most patients. Okay. So let's talk about when you talk to your doctor and said, enough with this. What can I do besides this? And it wasn't me who said that because, like I said, I was still playing Russian roulette, basically, with this weak heart. And I was drinking all types of fluids. You were? Eating everything I wasn't supposed to. Were you you gaining weight? I was not really. What I was, I was gaining water, fluid weight. Right. Not good weight. Just wearing on this heart. Well, what were you drinking? Um... Things that dialysis patients shouldn't have, like Pepsi, um, water, anything that tastes good. And a lot of times when you have kidney failure, your taste buds are affected. And so most of the things that probably taste good for you are probably not good for you. Right. Taste, that taste good to you are not good for you. So... So Basically, what's good for you? What's good for you? Let's just talk about that for a minute. What's good for you? What's good? If so you're probably if you're a kidney patient, you should probably be drinking water, um, limited amount of water. Really? If you're if you're a in center patient, oh in center. So patient. they usually tell you a liter a day. That's it. Yeah, because once you come in for treatment, they don't want to remove a lot of fluid because it lowers your, it can it becomes stressful on your body and your heart and wears and tears on your heart and so a lot of times when you do put on a lot of fluid. Um, your blood pressure drops, you feel nauseated, you get sick. Um, and those are a lot of the things that I experienced. Um, your body cramps because it's traumatizing to the body to put all that fluid in and then the, the uh, machine tries to remove all of that. And so it's like a, a chemical imbalance almost like in your body. And so you feel the effects of it. Right. And like I said, it's the low, low blood pressure, the cramping, the nausea. And so I went through that for about eight months. But it wasn't me who finally came to his senses. It was the doctor and the nurses who kind of brought me back to reality. They did? Yeah. Did they sit you down and say, look, girl? Well, what they did was first initially the doctor came by and he was talking about next stage. And he's like, um, I think. I have something for you that would be much gentler on your heart, um, something that you can work with. I think you would want to be at home. But he never showed me the machine, so he didn't. I kind of he didn't show me the machine. So I thought I was taking home the machine that I was already sitting next to me. And how big is that machine you were uh, sitting next to? Kind of like this, and almost like a mini refrigerator, but not the mini fridges that they have in colleges, but <laughs> the big ones. The big ones, yeah. So when did you finally see what it looked like? Finally saw it when my nurse, which was the person who kind of gave me the wake up call that I needed. She probably um, she talked to me maybe a good four or five times when I finally said, "Okay." And what really woke me up was when she mentioned my kids. She said, if you keep doing what you're doing, which is, you know, really playing Russian roulette with your heart, with all this fluid you're taking in and the foods that you're eating that don't, you know, help out with the weak heart, um, you won't see your kids grow up. And that was the wake-up call that I needed. 
it really was. And I'm mm-hmm. just like, she's right. And she came back with like a training date for me to get set up to go home. And she basically saved my life. She did. Let me ask you a question. Who became your partner? Initially, it was my mom and my sister. Mm-hmm. And Because um, you have to have a partner that you can train with. Yes. Correct? Yes, correct. And you do it in... In center, usually for six weeks. Is that true? Training on average is about a month. About and a on month? Average, on average is about a month. It all depends on how fast you pick up um, operating the machine. A lot of times um, learning cannulation, which is putting the needles in. That's a part of the process of learning um, mm-hmm. if you um, have a permanent access. And so... Like I said, it all depends on the patient, but they don't let you go until you're comfortable with the machine Mm -hmm. and when you're comfortable at home. So how did it feel the first time you did it at home? The first time Were you scared? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes? The first time, I'll be honest, I was scared. Um, And I actually called my nurse up and... I I was like, I just need to hear your voice while I'm hooking this up and um, while I'm going through this. I just want you to hear what I'm doing. And so she was like, oh, that's fine. And I say my nurses, even though it's a professional relationship, I feel like it's more of family because you you grow. Yeah, you grow close with them. They're there with you. You're training every day and they know your weaknesses, basically, and they learn um, about you. So. Um, I still talk to my nurse to this day. I've changed clinics, and I still am connected with that training nurse. That's important, don't mm-hmm. you think? I do. Um, we need to take a short break, and we'll be right back on okay. Catherine Raker's Let's Just Talk with the rest of your story and what you do today. Okay. All right. And that's what? Next stage? Oh, nxstage.com. <laughs> that's next stage. Nxstage.com. And we'll be right back on Katherine Raker's Let's Just Talk. <laughs> 